Hello, my name is Joseph Opong. I'm the Associate Vice Provost of the Toulouse Graduate School at the University of North Texas. I want to welcome you to the Spring 2021 virtual three-minute thesis master's competition. Due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot welcome you to our beautiful campus, but we can still showcase our tier one researchers. As one of the nation's largest universities, UNT offers 109 bachelor's, 94 master's, and 36 doctoral degree programs. We are ranked among the nation's 131 top tier research universities, according to the 2018 Carnegie classification of institutions of higher education. We are proud to be a very diverse Hispanic serving institution with 38,000 students, including 8,000 graduate students. I want to thank Phyllis Slocum and her students, Seth Bailey and Kaylee Bearden, for welcoming our contestants into the NTTV studio to record their three minute thesis presentations. It was important to me to maintain the spirit of presenting before a live audience, but COVID restrictions made that impossible. We chose to meet this element using the lights, sound checks, stage crew, and camera. I'm proud of our eight contestants, and it is our pleasure to present the annual spring 3MT Masters competition to you. The first place winner will receive $1,000, the second place $500, and we need your help to select the people's choice who will win $250. After watching this video, please go to the UNT Toulouse Graduate School website and vote for your favorite contestant. Thank you very much. Joseph, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark McClellan. I'm the Vice President of Research and Innovation here at the University of North Texas. And we are extraordinarily proud and happy to be here with you in celebration of the Three Minute Thesis. We are looking forward to the growth of this program. We're hoping that all of our academic departments and indeed all of our colleges get into the spirit and excitement of competition for this program. Now, why is this important? Because it is very important for all of us. The world is a very complex place these days, very challenging issues. And our scientists need to be able to speak up and talk about the strength and value of their research. This is critical. We need to learn to be communicators about the things that we're doing research on. And as we do that, we need to be able to walk down our street, visit with our neighbors, and talk to them about the importance of our research. The three-minute thesis is our introduction to starting that for all of our graduate students. And we are excited about the directions it's going. Now, the three-man thesis has been around for a while, but here in UNT, we are excited about the growth of it and the extension of it into all of our program areas. So we're looking forward to this competition. We know you're going to enjoy meeting these students, and we hope that at another time in the future, all of you, your families, et cetera, can all come and actually visit us here on the beautiful campus in Denton, Texas. It is gorgeous, and it's a time when you will enjoy an opportunity to come back to campus and visit. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy this competition, and most importantly, I hope you take to heart this message about communicating what we do in research. It's essential for our future of the universities and all programs that we do take this to heart and really go with it. So cheer on the competition, and let's see how things go. Congratulations for the competitors, and we we'll look forward to listening to you in a, in a few minutes. Thank you, Mark, and hello, everyone. As Dr. Opong mentioned, the 3MT competition is an interactive event that lets you vote for your favorite contestant. Now, when you open your program, you'll notice a ballot to cast your vote. Please hold on to that ballot until all the contestants have completed their presentations. The 3MT is judged based on two main criteria, comprehension and content, as well as engagement and communication. The first refers to the student's ability to explain their thesis research clearly and effectively. The second deals with stage presence and the contestant's ability to grab attention.
Our judges will watch the contestants and score them on a scale from one to 10 in each category. Our first place winner will take home $1,000. The runner up receives $500 and your vote will decide the people's choice winner for $250. With that, I'll take a moment to introduce our judges in the center of the room. These judges have generously volunteered their time to be here. Dr. Belvia Moody, Coordinator of Academic Support Services for the Tarrant County Community College South Campus. Justice Carlisle, Realtor. Mike Lands, Consulting Engineer. And Kim Huasa, Alterex Incorporated. Now it's time to invite our MC, Mike Sexton, to introduce our finalists. Thank you, Phyllis. First up is Araceli Hernandez Calderon. Her department is the School of Merchandising and Hospitality Management, Hospitality Management. The title of her 3MT presentation is Getting Hotels Back to Business. Araceli, please take the stage. If you do an internet search using hotels and COVID-19, the very first hit is an article from the Center for Disease Control title, Know Your Travel Risk. This publication states how hotel stays are risky. Consumer fear caused the hotel US industry to lose $84 billion in 2020. Hotels have now implemented enhanced cleaning practices, but it will take more than that for consumers to return in their pre-pandemic numbers. This is the challenge hotels are facing. How to best manage consumers' perceptions of staying at a hotel during a pandemic? My research addresses how hotel messaging is critical in managing consumers' perceptions of risk. The first question to address is, how do consumers assess risk? The assessment of risk involves two elements, the threat that is imposed by the risk and how to cope with it. With COVID, the threat will be, how likely am I to get COVID? And how seriously will it affect me? As a way to manage the perception of threat, hotels can provide COVID information in the frame of fear or hope messages. One important way in which hotels are helping consumers to cope with the COVID threat is by implementing enhanced cleaning practices. My research surveyed college students to see if a hotel internal cleaning process was adequate for them to cope or if coping was improved by knowing the hotel would implement an external accredited process. The combination of threat and coping assessment will lead to a student's booking intentions. Then the less the threat the, and the greater the intention or their ability to cope, the greater their intention to book. My research shows that the best strategy is to evoke emotions of hope and use an internal cleaning program. This is great news. Hotels um, uh, usually implement internal programs is less expensive and also easier to do than external accreditations. As a result of my research, I would like to provide the following guidance for the hotel industry. Hotels are not only encouraged to implement their internal cleaning programs, but also make sure you're sending a strong message of hope. This will help you to make a positive emotional connection with your consumers. Let them know that you're doing your best to keep them safe and they will come back. Thank you. Thank you, Araceli. Our next presenter is Juan Duen. Her department is the College of Information, Information Science. The title of her 3MT presentation is a graph database for the COVID-19 knowledge discovery. When, please take the stage. The COVID-19 has killed more than 2,690,000 people worldwide, and it has shut down the global economy. Many of us were isolated and depressed. But thankfully, with at least seven different vaccines rolling out globally now, I can see a big smile day that almost coming back to normal. We couldn't imagine how worse the situation could be if we didn't have the vaccine. The scientists developing those vaccines or conducting any study have to look at the previous research to identify the knowledge gaps and then be able to target those gaps. But now, more than 467,000 research papers about COVID-19 have been published. Do you think it's possible to read all these papers? 
It must be very challenging or even impossible. That's why my research comes in. My study aims to develop a way to synthesize a vast number of research papers to enable the researchers to search, access, and gain the core knowledge from those papers. My method is stimulated by the way the human brains think. Information in our brains is connected. When we learn the new knowledge, which is naturally linked to the existing one in our brain to form a better and more extensive understanding, that's exactly the way how my graph database has been developed. In my research, from those hundreds of thousands of research papers, I extracted all the concepts and the relation between them to build a searchable and retrievable graph database. Visually, it looks like the massive network you see on the screen now with the nodes representing the concept connected to the lines that we call relations. And now, let's see how it works. A scientist researching on COVID-19 vaccines is curious about what is the most popular ingredient of COVID-19 vaccine now? So he would search that keywords in my graph database and then magically all the synthesized knowledge from the related paper would turn into. And remember, this is the synthesized knowledge. That is more than the documents retrieved from the search engine like Google. And then automatically he can see what this study share in common and you'll find the mRNA is the most popular ingredient of COVID-19 vaccine now because all the paper connected to it. If he wants to learn more about it, he just simply click the note to expand it. Right now, my research is limited to COVID-19 research papers, but in the future, we definitely can input more papers that focus on the epidemic over the history to build a giant epidemic graph database. That preparedness will significantly improve our response to the future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Huen. Our next presenter is Janice Beith. Her department is the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, Applied Anthropology. The title of her 3MT presentation is Listening with Eyes, Ears, and Heart, Examining Trauma for Asylum Seekers Fleeing Gender-Based Violence. Janice, please take the stage. Applying for asylum in the United States is dependent upon collecting evidence of persecution in home country. And a large part of this estimate, the, this evidence is the testimony the asylum seeker gives about her experiences. And this testimony can be a particular stumbling block for gender-based asylum seekers, because when applying to the United States, there tends to be a misunderstanding about cultural practices or common trauma responses that can actually lead to a denial of asylum to them. For example, Aisha had a judge that didn't quite understand that um, arranged marriages were a legitimate form of marriage where she came from. Or to Rosa, who was cross-examined to tears because she was having difficulty recalling the night she was assaulted. And these are just two of the many stories I've heard throughout my research. And my research has really shown that the United States asylum-seeking system is not trauma-informed or culturally sensitive. And that the people who grant or deny asylum are not really listening to the whole context of the story. They're not listening with their eyes, ears, and heart. Heart may understand the lived experiences of the asylum seeker. I interviewed lawyers, psychologists, social workers, and other experts about issues asylum seekers have when going through the system, as well as looked at policies on gender-based violence, gender-based asylum seeking here in the United States, and compare them to the UN standards. And using these two research, these two methods, I found that the United States is not meeting the standards set by the UN for gender-based asylum seeking, as well as it's actually gotten worse in the past couple of years. This is terrible because asylum is the last form of aid the United States has before deporting someone back to home country to either live in fear, which is not really living, or to die. Now this is a complicated issue and it will not be solved overnight. My research specifically looks at how testimonies is perceived in the courtroom. And I'm looking, working with lawyers right now to try to make a report to make the courtroom a little bit more trauma-informed and culturally sensitive. So the judge might take into account that cultural differences when listening to testimony, or it might be empathetic to, it's to the idea that it's difficult to tell a cohesive story when you've been deeply traumatized. I hope my report is able to nudge the U.S. asylum seeking system a little bit more towards the U.N. standards of protecting gender-based asylum seekers. Because I know if I was fleeing violence and my, my life depended upon telling a complete stranger about the most traumatizing experiences of my life, I hope that stranger would be listening with their eyes, ears, and heart. Thank you. 
Thank you, Janice. Our next presenter is Mernaz Mogimi. Her department is the College of Science Biology. The title of their 3MT presentation is The Effect of Low Oxygen Level on Lead Toxicity and Calcium Deficiency. Mernaz, please take the stage. It is widely known that lead is in our environment and it is very harmful for our body. We are all aware of the problem being experienced in the field in Michigan, where they can't use the public water system due to the lead content. Lead is a toxic material that serves no purpose in our body. It harms us in many ways. My research is investigating one specific problem caused by lead, the displacement of calcium in our body. Why is lead absorbed by the body when it is not essential? Lead mimics calcium, and the body mistakenly absorbs lead, which results in the displacement of calcium. Calcium is an essential element for our body. It plays a vital role in the maintenance and formation of our skeleton and the regulation of both neural and muscular functions. Calcium is critical for our health. My research is looking for the effect of low oxygen on the absorption of lead. It is already known that a low oxygen condition decreases the absorption of calcium, but does a low oxygen condition also decrease the absorption of lead? This is the question my research will answer. I'm studying the lead absorption of zebrafish in a low oxygen environment to determine whether there is a link between oxygen levels and lead absorption. The zebrafish will be subjected in a test environment with low oxygen and lead. The lead and calcium levels in zebrafish after the test will be compared to the lead and calcium levels before the test. This test will clarify whether a low oxygen environment played a part in the absorption of lead and the displacement of calcium. I believe that the toxicity of lead will be reduced in a low oxygen condition. After my research is done, I will provide a deeper understanding of how different environmental stresses interact and how our body reacts to these interactions. Thank you. Thank you, Bernaz. Our next presenter is Craig McCain. His department is the College of Science Environmental Science. His 3MT presentation is Preserving Biodiversity to Reduce Zoonotic Disease Spillover. Craig, please take the stage. Have you noticed that in recent years, we've seen an alarming number of disease outbreaks, such as the Ebola virus and the coronavirus pandemic that we're currently living in? And we've been seeing rising cases of Lyme disease. So what do all these diseases have in common? They're zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that occurred in wild animals and then spilled over to infect people. Many of these diseases came from wild mammals. Now the risk of zoonotic disease spillover increases as we transform the environment and lose biodiversity. When people develop the landscape, wild landscapes, they fragment the habitat and consequently they fragment the wildlife communities. This leads to a change in the species composition. It can change the number of species and the identities of the species living in the wildlife community. This in turn, can remove natural ecological safeguards that are protecting us against zoonotic disease spillover. A good example of this is Lyme disease. As the habitat is lost and fragmented, the wildlife communities are eroded, predators are lost, and rodent populations, which are natural reservoirs of Lyme disease, expand, thereby expanding Lyme disease. Now for your health and for mine, and for the health of future generations, we need to reduce the number of of zoonotic disease spillover events. And to do this, we need to preserve the ecological safeguards that are present 
in diverse wildlife communities. And to do that, we need to preserve the species composition of these communities in these increasingly common fragmented landscapes. And this is where my research comes in. I'm studying how the configuration of the, of the landscape and how the dispersal of species from one community to the next across this fragmented landscape affects the species composition of wild mammal communities. To accomplish this, I've been using game cameras to survey local mammal communities, and they are in a set of publicly owned lands that are set in a privately owned rural landscape. I want to learn if the public lands are acting as a refuge for these mammal communities, forming sites for us to focus our conservation efforts. And I want to learn if the habitat in the landscape is exerting a natural selection force on the wild mammal communities, determining what species live in the wild mammal communities. Now this research is ongoing, but I am confident that by learning how wild mammal communities operate in these increasingly common fragmented landscapes, we will find a way to conserve the species composition and thereby preserve the ecological safeguards that are protecting us from zoonotic disease spillover. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next presenter is Lavinia Florentina Patia. Her department is the College of Science Mathematics. The title of her 3MT presentation is The Mathematics Behind Artificial Intelligence. Lavinia, please take the stage. Did you know that brain and spinal cord tumors are the second most common cancer for, in children from infant to 14 years of age in the US? Brain tumors can strike anyone of any age. The purpose of my research is to improve brain cancer detection using artificial intelligence. In other words, how can we fine tune the algorithm such that the computer prediction will always be accurate and reliable? Artificial intelligence is a field within computer science where the programming code is dynamic and able to learn by itself from other similar situations. This particular type of code is called artificial neural network. What I do in my research is to develop an artificial neural network that will be able to predict if a person is healthy or unhealthy based on their brain scan in a matter of seconds. My code takes an input, in this case, a brain scan, and then the algorithm will process this input such that it will provide an output, namely if the patient is healthy or unhealthy. How will I do this? I'm going to use a huge collection of both healthy and unhealthy brain scans from previous patients to train a network to differentiate between the two outcomes. Once the network is trained, I plug in new images for which I know what the label should be, such that I can evaluate my network accuracy. This will allow the efficiency of my network model to be compared to those of other researchers that are using different approaches than I'm using. Brain scans, brain scans um, can appear to be very hazy and hard to examine even for an experienced doctor. However, a neural network is trained on thousands of situations that they can recall almost instantaneously, while a doctor is trained on a much more limited number of cases. I'm excited about the prospect of my research contributing to the advancement of medical science, allowing doctors to diagnose and detect brain tumors in very premature stages will enable a greater chance of successful treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Lavinia. Our next presenter is Ronfang Zhang. Their department is the Toulouse Graduate School Interdisciplinary Studies. The title of their 3MT presentation is Improving Relationships by Using Information Technology. Ronfang, please take the stage. Did you realize that nearly 4.6 million foreign-born adults live in the United States? These adults don't live in the country where they were raised. Therefore, they deprived of important interpersonal relationships. We thrive on relationships. They are critical to people's health and well-being, particularly to older adults. But it is hard for older immigrants to establish new relationships due to cultural barriers. 
Maintaining relationships with family and friends in their home country is difficult because they cannot interact face to face. This has a huge impact on their well-being. Here's the concern. How do these older immigrants manage their relationships? How do they avoid homesickness and loneliness? My research explores how older immigrants use communication technology, such as smartphone and social media, to manage their relationships. Do these technologies improve their quality of life? To answer the question, I will use a survey to gather data from 500 immigrants in the Dallas Fort Worth area over the age of 65. Once the survey has been completed, the data will be analyzed to see if there is a link between the communication technology and improved relationships. This could improve the quality of life for older immigrants. My research is important. If it shows a link between the communication technology and the well-being of older immigrants, it could drive a policy of providing low-cost communication technology to older immigrants as a way to reduce healthcare costs. In 2017, American Association of Retired Persons study, the cost to Medicare for social isolation was estimated at 6.7 billion annually. My research could greatly reduce the healthcare costs associated with this isolation. My hope is to improve the quality of life for older immigrants by using communication technology to build a more connected world. Thank you. Thank you, Rongfan. Our last presenter is G. Giamarco. His department is the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences Applied Anthropology. The title of his 3MT presentation is Community, Social Network, and Health. G, please take the stage. I currently live in the city of Fort Worth. My apartment is just south of downtown. It's in an up and coming historic area with coffee shops, music venues, and a burgeoning art scene all within walking distance of my apartment. I love living there. The area is also home to the medical city of Fort Worth, where there are three major hospitals and numerous other medical facilities and physician's offices. When I needed to take my fiance to the hospital last month, it took us maybe five minutes to get to the emergency room. The area sounds great, right? Well, an interesting fact about where I live is that those who live there have the lowest life expectancy in the entire state. The average life expectancy of those in my area is 67 years. The state and county average life expectancy, 79 years. Despite living in such a great area, why is it that I and those in the community have such a lower life expectancy? My research is trying to answer this question. And the aim of my research is to apply whatever I find to help develop or aid in the development of programs that improve the health of those in the area, as well as in other parts of the city. Looking at all the research on health inequalities, it's extremely complex. There are so many factors that can affect your health, and the experts all disagree on what the major factors are. Well, I thoroughly believe that we are our own experts on our own experience. So I decided to take a bottom-up approach. I talk to people. I talk to those who live and work in the community, those who are embodied by this low life expectancy statistic. There are several findings um, during my research. Uh, but one of the findings that took my eye was this idea of social health resources. When people think of health resources, they usually think of something material, a hospital, a vaccine. Social health resources are really about what one knows and who one knows. Two issues with social health resources I found really affected those in this area. The first one is that information about local health services was inaccessible, inefficient, and incomplete creating an issue of what one knows. The other issue was that there did not seem to be a strong sense of community, creating an issue of who one knows. Even if there was one person who knew all about the health resources and services in the area, they could spread that information through the social network and really benefit the entire community through the social network. So how can community and social network be strengthened? 
that's not a simple task. Made further complicated by COVID, our pandemic, and our inability to see each other. So far, I hope to create a accessible online resource system so that people can get information and to collaborate on a program so that we can create people who become health nodes and social health resource nodes for their communities. Thank you, G. Now that all of our contestants have presented, please take a moment to visit the UNT Toulouse Graduate School's website and cast your vote for the People's Choice Award. This concludes the first section of the 2021 Spring 3MT Masters Competition.